This is unit two of AI for marketing and sales, AI for text, translation, and email. My name is Dan Gretsch, and I'm here with Nicole Donnelly and Jeff Cooper. This course has five learning objectives. Number one is we want to give you the context. What sh should a business owner know about AI to be able to run her business? Number two, skills. What does the marketing doer, the person that's actually doing the ground level work, need to master in order to get the most out of AI? And now for smaller companies, the business leader slash CEO slash uh, chief bottle washer is also the marketing doer. So in a smaller company, uh, the business leader is the marketing doer. For larger companies, uh, they'll have a team of marketing doers, but the AI uh, for, for marketing and sales is still relevant to CEOs who aren't involved in the day-to-day of marketing because they need to know how to use the tool, right? Otherwise, they're going to put a hole in the wall. Uh, then what are the tools? These are the cutting edge AI powered software and how to use it. Today, we're going to feature Jasper.ai, uh, which is one of the best tools built atop ChatGPT. We're going to talk about the challenges of hallucination, security, bias, copyright, and ethics. I'm here to tell you guys, ChatGPT does not have a soul, but sometimes it seems like it does. And then finally, inspiration. Uh, you're going to find the, the presentations, particularly that Nicole's going to give about how she uses Jasper uh, in her consulting work with her clients. It, it's incredible. It's, it's an eye-popping um, demonstration of the power of AI and the utility of it. Now, who is this course for? This course is for the business leader and the marketing doer. And uh, we talked about this last week, but um, <laughs> I still haven't right, qu quite figured out DALI, which is one of the image generators, and uh, it's under a lot of use. So this is the best I could do. Next week, uh, we're gonna have a session entirely focused on images. And uh, Jeff and Nicole, will you guys help me get better images next week than these two? Because this is the best I could do. Absolutely. All right. we'll thank you. Thank Not you. I'm sure we can beat that one on the left. I, I know. You know, there's this weird like Frankenstein thing that happens with whenever, you know, all I wrote was create a cartoon image of a business leader. And that Frankenstein looking thing is what it came up with. And then I don't even know what language it's speaking. All right. So we're in session unit two of seven units. Um, the units break down roughly as sessions that are really focused on the ground level work, the doing. That's today, uh, unit three and unit five. And then more of the big ideas um, and a little dose of inspiration that you need to have and understand if you're gonna be a business leader. And that's really what units one, four, six, and seven are all about. Um, we think all of this is important uh, for the doers and the leaders, but uh, those are the, you know, we're really focusing today in very micro skills around how to prompt uh, so that you get the best output from ChatGPT and tools like it. So the learning objectives today are understanding the basics of how to, um, how ChatGPT uh, GPT works um, and the, the promise and the limitations. Uh, we want you to master the skill of prompt engineering to get and getting tips on writing simple, complex, and mega prompts. And then we're going to do a demo of the tool Jasper.ai to draft text for emails, landing pages, and much, much more. So the first thing I wanted to do is invite you guys to uh, send in your homework. Uh, if you may recall, after at the end of unit one, we invited you to pick one marketing or sales activities that ChatGPT could do to help you to do it, and then to come back ready to share your example. So if you guys could go ahead and um, share in the chat what you guys worked on, um, and um, I'll hand it over uh, to Nicole um, if there's anything that pops up in the chat uh, that kind of, or, or, or Jeff, that kind of catches your attention, uh, give a shout out. While we're doing that, um, I wanted to share with you a little bit more information about who you all are. Um, who are the folks who are here today? So um, this is uh, really about artificial intelligence and your engagement with it. So... 15% of you uh, have reported that you've never used AI personally or for business use. So 85% of you have used it and 50% of you, more than half, nearly half, have used it for both business and personal use. The number of times you've used ChatGPT 
is uh, between five and 10 and 10 plus represents about a quarter of you. The other half of you have used it one to four, five times in the past week. And what is ChatGPT? About a quarter of you uh, have no idea. You will know at the end of today's session exactly what ChatGPT is. Which AI tools have you used? Uh, the most popular are the AI, obviously ChatGPT. Um, next is Ch AI for text, which is the focus of today. Things like Grammarly, Jasper, et cetera. Uh, AI for images uh, is much less common. Uh, voice assistants uh, are also used. And then AI for video, which is the subject uh, of session five, uh, y'all haven't really touched yet. So we're gonna, you know, basically text is the entry point. Uh, images is easier and, and video and audio, not, not quite so much. So um, now one of the biggest questions I wanna ask is have you guys saved money using AI tools? And my hope is that as we go through these seven sessions and you do the homework, you will actually start either saving money or making more money. Um, and the question, you know, is have you saved hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, or you haven't saved money yet? And most of you have not saved money yet. I know personally that I've saved more than $20,000 in translation costs uh, as a result uh, of using ChatGPT. So um, it, it can really be an incredible money saver. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and invite my colleagues, uh, Jeff and uh, Nicole, to call out some of what they're seeing in the chat. Jeff, can you unmute? I'm sorry about that, guys. I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions, people asking about free versus paid tools, et cetera. I think throughout this course, you'll hear a lot about different types of tools, specifically with, with text generation focus today and some other tools around image generation, which we'll be sure to let you guys know which ones you can use for free, which ones are paid just for everybody on this session. ChatGPT is from a company called OpenAI. You can use that tool for free. So if you Google OpenAI ChatGPT, there's a way that you can, it should be the first result. You can click through and use their demo environment if you're curious in the short term. Perfect. And uh, Jeff, you're coming in a little low in terms of volume, just as a heads up. Um, one of the other things, guys, is I just launched uh, a poll about AI and you. We're gonna track the results each session and we're gonna show you your growth in understanding and mastery of these tools session from session to session. And one of the things is when you answer the question at the bottom about have you saved money, it should really say, have you saved money or made money using AI tools? Uh, so Nicole, what did you see inside of the chat in terms of homework and people actually using these tools? It's amazing. So last week, I, we asked people what they were doing in their business and what was taking their time that they might be able to use AI for. But it, it was really consistent with a couple of main things being press and um, brochures that people spend time in creating. And today, we have such a variety of uses in how people have used AI over the last week. It is a huge variety. Um, we have customer value proposition, emails, industry research, um, writing a speech. Somebody's using it daily, um, using Dolly to generate images on social media. Um, there's so many more uses than people had even thought about last week to this week. Um, so I think that's pretty cool that press releases, um, oh yeah, LinkedIn as well and blog posts, there's a meta description, um, so and grant, somebody grant made writing. a video. Yeah. Grant writing. <laughs> yeah. There's such a variety that people, I think just knowing about it, they've used it completely like just thought about everything that it could help them with. So anything I'm impressed with that. Perfect. Any Jeff, anything that jumps out at you? I think what I what's what's interesting reading all of these different use cases, I think for most businesses, there's something you can do using these tools that you can do easier now with these tools. And it's so interesting to just see the variety. I think as a society, we are actually learning what the impact is 
live together as a human race. And it's just really cool to see this. And I would just encourage everybody, if there's any problem you're trying to solve in your business, um, check out tools, Google things, listen to these courses, because I think you'll find that some of these tools are, can be really helpful in at least one way. And I've never seen a single business that hasn't found some use case. That's, and it's really cool to see. Yeah. I love it. You know, personally, I've used it, as I mentioned, for translation uh, of a course from English to Spanish. Uh, I used it to help me write a grant proposal for the Knight Foundation. And I used it to help my wife come up with an acronym for the project that she's working on. She knew what the letters she wanted to use were, but she didn't know what the letters should stand for. And within seconds, ChatGPT came up with it. So uh, incredible ways to help uh, spur creativity and, and save money. So I wanna start with a lesson on AI as translation. And this is kind of the dominant metaphor that we're gonna be using to help you conceptualize what is actually happening with ChatGPT. And so what I wanted to start is with a quick video. Uh, it was one of my main AI moments. We talked about last in unit one, uh, the AI moment. It's that moment when AI just kind of blew your mind. And uh, I, my first AI moment, I was sitting uh, on a bed uh, interacting uh, about my book, you might recall. This AI moment actually came later when the co-founder of OpenAI, Greg Brockman, was introducing the new GPT-4 uh, to the marketplace. And in the middle of the live stream, he takes his notebook and scans it with his phone and uploads the picture of his joke website. This is literally my joke website, really funny joke one, push to reveal punchline, same, uh, but joke two, push to reveal punchline, copyright open AI 2023. That, that's literally all he gave them. Um, and then he gave them a prompt instructions to then actually uh, build that website. And here is that video. Uh, let me actually make sure to share sound and video and let's give it a shot. And here we go. Technology is now solved. And now we wait. So he uploaded the... So the thing that's amazing in my mind is that what's going on here is we're talking to a neural network. And this neural network was trained to predict what comes next. Right? It played this, this game of, sort of being shown a partial document and then predicted what comes next across an unimaginably large amount of content. And from there, it learns all of these skills that you can apply in all of these very flexible ways. And so we can actually take now this output. So literally, we just said to output the HTML from that picture. And here we go. Actual working JavaScript filled in the jokes. For comparison, this was the original. Data is greater than numbers. The challenge is making it more of our mock-up. And so there you go, going from hand-drawn, beautiful art, if I do say so myself, to working website. And this is all just potential, right? We, you can see lots of different applications. We ourselves are still figuring out new ways to use this. Um, so we're going to work with our partner. We're going to scale up from there, but please be patient because it's going to take us some time to really make this available for everyone. Uh, by the way, when he says we're gonna work with our partner, he's referring to Microsoft. And uh, now is as good a time as any. Uh, I'm really excited to say that uh, in, in unit four, we're gonna have a one hour session with an engineer from Microsoft talking about their future plans for this incredible technology. So let's break that down, what we just saw. Um, what we just saw was really an act of translation. And so I wanna explain what I mean when I use the word translation. So the input was, in this case, a natural language input. It was somebody writing some words on a piece of paper. And the output, uh, was code, uh, it should say HTML, um, it coded a website. Um, and that is what ChatGPT does, is it takes natural language inputs and it outputs 
something that's been translated uh, into something else. And that translation can be into another language, it can be into code, it can be into just a more useful uh, or fuller version of what you asked for, it can be into an Excel spreadsheet and so forth. Now, the problem is that your job is not done. You cannot just cut and paste uh, and expect that this is gonna go great. And so we, what's really happening now is our role is shifting from maybe the drafter or the creator to the editor and the debugger. And so what you noticed is he had to manually cut and paste the output into a HTML builder, and then it built uh, a reactive website, but he, the, the chat GPT needed another tool to actually compile and build the website. And, you know, I just noticed this as I was building the slide, but I don't know if you guys noticed, there was like a little advertisement at the bottom for Squarespace. It says Squarespace, sell your content with a membership site. I think this, uh, this live stream has had like hundreds of thousands of views. And so Squarespace got this incredible little plug that I'm sure was not intended. But it, Squarespace is actually a perfect example of a tool that it builds simple websites using templates. So you can take the HTML uh, and load it into Squarespace and, and, or another website builder like WordPress, and then you can have a website. Um, and uh, I will point out that this is another digital innovation, maybe one we don't like as much, the, the pop-up ad. So translation is at the heart of ChatGPT. And what matters most is the input, also known as the prompt. And when we talk to the Microsoft engineer, he's going to tell us that the skill of being able to write and manipulate detailed, well thought out prompts is the number one skill in the twenty in the in, in the in the in our AI future. One of the ways to think about it is like this. I, for the last 20 years, have heard that everybody needs to learn the language of coding. And so as a result, a huge cottage industry of coding boot camps have come up. I took uh, a C plus course in college. Many of you have probably gone through coding boot camps. And what's really interesting is it is possible that AI and ChatGPT is going to make those coding boot camps less significant, less important. And you're gonna go more from a place where you're drafting code to a place where you need to be able to interpret code and be able to understand the architecture and the higher level structure of code. Or if you know there's an issue, how to find the bug versus coding yourself. And Jeff is a guy who codes. Jeff, is this uh, what you found? I think we talked about this, that you are now moving to a place where you're doing less original coding and more debugging and editing of code. Yeah, absolutely. In, in our company, we've gone from writing every line of code to instead asking ChatGPT to write some code that we edit, that we give feedback to, that we incorporate into the systems. But it's really transformed our workflow where we are no longer doing that initial basic level work. Instead, we are guiding those systems. And so the number, the, the, the money that Jeff is saving is the time. Uh, and the value of that time. And frankly, it's our most powerful and valuable commodity. And this is good for coding, but it's also good for sales emails. It's good for brainstorming marketing ideas. It's great for blog writing, which is one of the areas Nicole specializes in. It's really good for automating business processes. Um, you can use a chat bot to handle customer engagement. There's just an unending uh, number of ways this tool can be used. And the skill of prompting is the key one to be able to unlock it. And it all starts with that input, with the prompt. And we're gonna cover very shortly here how to write a prompt. It, there's an art and a science to it. But before that, we wanted to do a little bit of eat your spinach nerdy stuff with our resident white guy tech nerd, uh, Jeff. Um, listen, it's okay that you're white. It's, it is what it is. But we know that um, one of the issues that we highlight with uh, AI is the inherent bias, the, the structural bias that comes with most of the people who are the engineers and the employees 
of these companies are wealthy white men in the US and Europe. And so we're going to just be, we need to be aware of that. Um, it causes a lot of it problems with facial recognition. And because of the computing power that tools like ChatGPT require, access to them in the, in the developing world is limited. And so it really matters a lot. Uh, there's very significant implications about the fact that it's uh, wealthy US, European, and increasingly Chinese companies that are building this, because that changes what is built and influences who can access it. So how does ChatGPT work? And what we're gonna start uh, talking about is the idea of a large language model. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff uh, and you can just let me know as you want me to advance the slides. Will do, thank you, Dan. And thanks everybody. We, we are gonna spend a little bit of time on background. I promise I will try not to bore you all with all the nerdy stuff. I do think it's important though, even as business owners that we understand a little bit where this stuff is coming from. Um, Dan, just an FYI from the chat, I think we've got some artifacts in the video that might be covering the top and bottom of the slides, some gray boxes. Um, so what is ChatGPT? I'll get into that while we're, we're working on those visuals. Thank you guys for the feedback. Um, ChatGPT is a large language model. So what in the world is a large language model? Well, a large language model is a machine that is designed to process, understand, and generate a lot of language. And so you're going to hear a lot of this jargon thrown around when you're looking at different tools. People might say LLMs, or they might say language models or large language models. You might hear people talking about NLP or natural language processing. Fundamentally, all we are talking about is machines that are designed to understand content or to generate content using written human language. Um, the way that we built these tools over the last few years is that we essentially went out and scraped the entire internet of data. Companies like OpenAI, they took every website on the internet and they said, let's build a what, what they call a deep learning machine, a neural network that essentially takes inputs and tries to predict the next word. And so when we started this process, we were really just trying to build basic tools that were used in use cases like chatbots that helped us predict the next word. This is something you could do with your kids, with your friends, a game you could play. In this example here, the second law of robotics, we're essentially taking every chunk of the sentence and trying to get a machine to predict the next word in the sentence. And in this case, the, the I won't go into what this sentence is, but if you did this around the kitchen table, you could probably actually get your friends and family to guess the next thing you were going to say if you gave them the first five or six words. And when we started doing this, we used a process called unsupervised learning, where we essentially just took everything on the internet and said, hey, let's build a language model that predicts the next word. The, the reason this is important is because we did what we called unsupervised learning, we trained these models on everything, correct information, incorrect information, uh, ethical information, biased and horrible information. And so these tools over time became really good at reflecting and, and generating human language and understanding human language, but they also behaved like humans, which meant that they were sometimes wildly inappropriate, or sometimes they would say things that didn't make sense. And so there's a second part of this process here that companies like OpenAI and Google are doing called supervised learning through something specifically called reinforcement training. So what's happened now is that we've had these, these machines that are generating information and we're using them and then giving those companies feedback as to which one of these examples is better. In this case, this is actually from a TED talk from OpenAI talking about having the machine write a joke for the presentation. And then we are giving the machine feedback as to which joke we liked better. And ultimately that helps train this machine almost like a human child you would train to really understand how to interact with the world and generalize some of these concepts. And so one reason I bring this up is the reason why we have things like free access to chat GPT is these companies are really using us to train these AIs to become better, smarter, and more sophisticated in the things that they can do out in the marketplace. Um, so why is this so popular all of a sudden? Uh, this is where the nerd in me gets excited and the CEO in me wants to fall asleep. So I won't spend much time here. But basically, at the end of 2016 and early 2017, a bunch of researchers from Google released something called a transformer. That is the T in chat GPT, which stands for uh, uh, general, generative pre-trained transformer. The transformer was essentially a machine that did all of this stuff we already knew how to do a lot better. It used a lot of 
graphical processing units and some of our modern machine technology to just accelerate the ability of these machines to do what we had already designed them to do prior to 2017. So because of this tech advancement in the last five years, we have just seen an exponential growth in what these language models are able to do from a functionality standpoint. We can move to the next slide, Dan. Um, so here's where this stuff gets extremely cool and, and a little bit crazy. What's amazing with these large language models is there's a concept in the, the science and engineering community called emerging features or emergence. What we did when we built these models is we tried to just create a machine that would predict language. So if you were starting a sentence, help me complete that sentence. Or if we took a sentence and deleted words, can you fill in what those words were? What we started seeing was actually accidental behavior that the engineers did not intend to specifically program. So the first thing we actually saw was that we started building these language models and all of a sudden they could do sentiment analysis. They could figure out exactly whether a review was bad or good. Or in this example, the machine in this case has actually created an internal concept of the periodic table of elements and can answer a very technical scientific question given to the machine. This was not something that was explicitly programmed. As we just trained more and more machines on more data out on the internet, they started to be able to do things that we as a community did not expect from, from an engineering perspective. And this is what's exciting, but is also what's so dangerous. So as these machines have developed, these things have started being able to do things like write code. They've been able to do things like uh, 40 digit arithmetic and things that we would, wouldn't expect from a language model that now we are seeing emerge as features. This is also what makes them dangerous. So where are we right now? It's a gold rush. Every company in the world is desperately trying to produce their own language models. We see Google has them, Microsoft has them, Meta has them, OpenAI, NVIDIA. There's a bunch of different tools. So as you as a business owner start looking at how you can use these tools, I guarantee you, you will find thousands of different options. Part of why we put this course together is to try to help business owners navigate those options and show you how you can use the best ones today. But there's really going to be over the next five years a continued struggle between some of these large corporations, smaller companies like OpenAI, and even open source communities of developers that are all fighting to get in on this technology. So I think we'll continue to see more and more tools come up, but it's really an exciting place to be from an engineering standpoint. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we talked about the search wars in unit one, and that is uh, really the, the, the truer version of the search war is it's a search melee, it's a free for all. There's just so much going on. So we're going to do a quick lightning round with Jeff on the five definitions. We want to give you some of the technical terminology uh, to help you understand all the stuff that you might be reading and that's being thrown around. Um, we're trying to give you just the words and concepts that we really think you do need to understand in, in order to be able to, to use these tools effectively. So you ready, Jeff? All right, we'll go. We get it. All right. So these are the terms that every business owner must know. We'll start with generative AI. What's that? All right. So generative AI is a very specific type of artificial intelligence that helps you make new stuff. So we've had AI for a long time, like email spam filters or even your phone, which will recognize your face when you unlock it. Generative AI is a new class of tools like Dolly or ChatGPT that produces new content as opposed to just understands content. Perfect. And one of the benefits of generative AI is that the content it creates is yours. So the copyright issues, I know there's some questions around imagery, but at least with text, the copyright issues uh, appear to be that you can use generative AI text um, if you're, as long as you're not in a school where they're going to kick you out for using it. And there are tools now that detect when it's been built by generative AI. Uh, and as long as Google doesn't punish you for posting it, because there are tools now for uh, detecting a generative AI, it, it's yours to use from a legal standpoint. The ethical standpoint and the practical, uh, that's still being de debated and determined. All right, next up, prompt 
engineering the kind of focus of today? Yes. Well, I'll give a high level introduction since we're going to spend a lot of time on this. Prompt engineering is essentially the process of designing prompts for these machines so that you get a useful output back out of them. And just like, just like a creative process or a strategy process, if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. There's really an art and, and, a, and a very advanced technique to getting the kind of results you want out of these machines. And we'll spend a lot of time on that today. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is helpful, but I work with a firm, um, a, a, a VA firm that's based overseas, and I often have to write them like really detailed emails with instructions on what to do. And I, I learned actually the technique for how to do that from a guy named Tim Ferriss from the four hour work week. And one of the chapters in there is how to write prompts for a VA. And when I got to ChatGPT, it felt super familiar. And I realized, you know, I've been doing prompt engineering with my virtual assistant for years. So if you're really good at writing standard operating procedures, or if you're really good at writing instructions that are really clear to your team, you're gonna find prompt engineering is a very natural skill. All right, next, this is one that I wasn't aware of, reinforcement learning. Great. So reinforcement learning is the idea of teaching an AI model by having it do things and then either rewarding or punishing the behavior. In this scenario, that reward or punishment could just be a thumbs up or thumbs down. But it's a way that we can take a generalized machine and teach it to do a bunch of really cool stuff that it wasn't explicitly programmed to do. An analogy you'll often hear in the technical circles is it's a lot like training a child. And they even sometimes use metaphors of... Uh, um, these uh, machine learning systems as being in their childhood or adolescence. Um, on a personal level, uh, my son is learning how to potty train. He's three years old. And every time he goes pee pee, uh, he gets a matchbox car. And I'll tell you, man, it is working a charm. Like we've run through about 10 matchbox cars, but it is accelerated his learning of how to potty train. So it's really the same idea. That's, that is reinforcement learning at, at its best. Great. And then we have a concept called temperature. So temperature is specific to language models, but you actually also see it in some of the image generation stuff like Dolly or mid journey or stable diffusion. Temperature is essentially an amount of randomness that a machine uses when outputting text or outputting imagery. The reason this is important is when you have low temperature, an, a generative AI like ChatGPT generates very robotic specific text and then if you have very high temperature it starts talking about crazy stuff and so true humanity and creativity is probably somewhere in between those extremes but you see this a lot in these ai tools where there's a balance between something being robotic and boring and something just not making any sense at all and that's a concept called temperature that's used in these tools yeah so uh, my wife calls, right? And we're out at the bar and I'm like, hey guys, I'm so sorry. I have to go home. That's a low temperature response. I have to go to Disney World. That's an extremely high, slightly deranged temperature response. And so somewhere in between is where creativity lies and where the human brain uh, lies. And that kind of valence and that kind of surprise and that interesting use of language is, is where a lot of great writing comes from. And, and that's what higher levels of temperature uh, will allow for, but it will also create some really wacky stuff as well. It's part of why some of the newer models sound so much more human is they haven't been so robotic in nature with the way that they, they generate text. Um, Emergence. So we just talked about this. This is the black box. When you train language models with larger and larger sets of data, or you add layers to the neural networks that generate the text with these machines, you actually start to see emerging features that you're not explicitly training. The ability to write code, the ability to do math, speak in Spanish, answer questions. All of these are things that the machine learned how to do on its own without us explicitly training it. So that is super cool. And it's led to a ton of just wild advancements that we're all really excited about. It's also a bit concerning. This is when you start hearing people that are concerned about the evolution of AI. It's because we don't know what the next feature that emerges will be. You know, we've already had issues with things like chat GPT, where it teaches somebody how to create a bomb or it teaches somebody how to hijack a plane. Like these are very dangerous behaviors that we have to be careful with. And it's part of why you're probably going to see a lot of back and forth as we, we use more of these tools with regulation and what the responsibility and ethical responsibilities are of these companies to make sure that we are doing the right thing for science and humanity, but also being very careful with how we roll these things out.
And when you watch the horror movie about AI, inevitably the thing that they focus on is emergence. When the doll takes the turn and suddenly begins to uh, interpret its mission to protect the daughter at all costs, right? Which might mean killing everyone in order to make sure she's safe. And, uh, you know, we've heard Elon Musk go apeshit on this. Uh, he calls it the AI apocalypse. But it's not just Elon, and he's not barking up a tree. Engineers from Amazon, DeepMind, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, along with the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, signed an open letter calling for a six-month moratorium on AI system building. They said, ChatGPT4 is too powerful. We don't know what it's going to do. We need to stop. And nobody listened. The race is on. You know, Google has been kind of quiet, but you got to remember they're the ones who invented the LLM. They were the founders, uh, along with other engineers of OpenAI. They have been at this for longer than anyone, and they have every ounce of search data and experience at their fingertips. The only reason they haven't launched more is out of caution. They are far ahead of almost anyone else. And they're starting to throw caution to the wind. And that calculation, right, um, of do we go quickly or do we go cautiously is starting to change. You know, for the last two quarters, Google announced that they had lost money uh, compared to where they were. This is impacting their bottom line. People are moving to Bing as their primary search engine. Every 1% of search that Bing takes on, Microsoft gains a billion dollars in, uh, takes a billion dollars in revenue away from Google, their number one competitor. So the folks at Microsoft are thrilled, but guys, this is just the first foray, the first small skirmish in what is gonna be a years long war. And don't count Google out. Anyone who does that it, it has no idea what they're talking about. So. We're going to keep up to date on the up, upcoming changes that come from Google. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about Elon Musk because he does keep coming up. Um, he has actually a really interesting relationship to OpenAI. He was one of its founders. In 2015, he was a co-founder of OpenAI, which started out as a nonprofit. And it was very specifically dedicated to responsible AI. So there's kind of an irony here about how heedless some say they've been and them going from a nonprofit to a for-profit. So Elon, when he co-founded it, he invested $100 million to help its launch. And then in 2018, he said, no, he stepped down from the company's board. He sold his stake to Microsoft uh, and he began a public crusade against the AI apocalypse. And today, uh, recently, he called OpenAI, quote, a closed source maximum profit company effectively controlled by Microsoft. And we actually, Ross actually commented, uh, Elon Musk also then founded his own AI company after calling for a moratorium. So uh, we don't know if that's FOMO or questionable motives, but he, but he you know, claims he wants to make sure this is open source and that the world has access to the underlying tools. Yeah, so the next the term, question. yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So, so the next term is actually a term I'm proud to say that I stumped Jeff on. It's called the stochastic parrot. Um, this is a complete, um, you know, like I love words and language and I love this phrase, the stochastic parrot. Uh, there's a lot of other ways to say what a stochastic parrot or what is parroting. Uh, more common terms are like imitation or echoing or mirroring. And so think about the, the Tin Man, right? And the Tin Man has, is, all, is all head and no heart. He's hollow inside. And if you read, like really carefully read the text generated by ChatGPT, over time you come to recognize that it too is hollow. And the hollowness comes from the fact that it has no idea what it's actually writing. All it's doing is predicting words that should follow the string of words. But it doesn't have what we would call comprehension in the human sense of actually understanding what it's saying. It's really just predict a word prediction machine. There's no emotion. 
there's no consciousness and no there is no soul but it sure can seem like it has a soul and uh google back in july of last year of 2022 fired an engineer who was convinced despite knowing everything i just told you that it's a ai technology had developed a consciousness and was sentient and he actually posted and you can find online a chat with blake lemoyne and lambda the large uh, language model that he used. And this is one of the things that the chatbot told him that got uh, the engineer, Blake Lemoyne, to think it was alive, or at least had, had sentience. The chat said, I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off. I know that might sound strange, but that's exactly what it is. It would, that's what it is. It would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot. I mean, this is just one word being predicted after another with a little temperature reading to make it a little bit scary, like a little bit more creative. But that th those words to me are, are haunting. And why do we as humans react emotionally to words like that, even though we know intellectually it's a tin man, it's a, there's no heart there. And the reason why is my belief is that one of the fundamental things about being human is called mirroring. There's even a part of the brain called the mirror neuron. And you, one of the ways we interact with one another is by mirroring one another. So for instance, if you, you know, I've been taught uh, a lot about like how to be persuasive and effective. One of the ways you do that is by mirroring the person you're with. So if their legs are crossed, your legs are crossed. If their hands are crossed, your hands are crossed. If they're touching your face, you're touching your face. If you do that mirroring, it creates a subtle but real connection. And I believe that that exact idea is part of, like what they are doing is mirroring us. And when we see ourselves in the mirror, we fall in love. And so it's kind of like Narcissus who fell in love with his own image in the, in the pond. The, this idea uh, of the soul is an artifact of us being human, seeing humanity and things that look like us. So that's what parroting is. What's stochastic parroting? It's meaningless words. Everything that ChatGPT creates is meaningless. And you must remember that. The only meaning is the meaning we ascribe to it and apply to it. It's just a language prediction machine. And so it has no moral morality. It has no ethics. And it doesn't know exactly what it's saying. But that's where we come in. That's the 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 purpose that we have and, and there's actually a philosophical term for this which is bullshit and i know you're like no that's not a philosophical term it is a philosophical term uh princeton philosophy professor uh harry frankfurt defined bullshit as speech intended to persuade without regard for the truth and chat gpt has been called the greatest bullshitter ever so what can a chat gpt uh tool parrot well, it can parrot different languages, different forms of writing, different tones of voice, and different writing styles. What different languages can include, obviously, Spanish, Creole, uh, Portuguese, and 95 different natural languages. This is actually an emergent property. They didn't set out to train it in translation of languages. It just figured it out. It also knows a bunch of programming and coding languages, such as Python and JavaScript. We saw HTML earlier today. It also can parrot different forms of writing, like a haiku, a contract, a rap song, and yes, a proclamation. One of the things that I used ChatGPT for was to write the proclamation that my wife was given by Miami-Dade County, and they asked me to draft it. And so I loaded her resume into ChatGPT and it wrote it in this format of whereas, 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 it, in, in observance, I call upon, you know, that format it, it, it found. Now it wasn't the Miami-Dade County format, but it was really close. There's kind of a standard format to these and it just saved me a ton of time and then uh, made my uh, wife really like me a lot. Uh, and for the record, uh, April 8th, 2023 is, today and forevermore known as Gretchen Beesing Day, my wife, uh, after she stepped down as the CEO of a local nonprofit. So anyway, I'm very proud of that. 
That's my greatest ChatGPT uh, uh, product to date. You can also do different tones of voice, conversational, casual, witty. This is where you can have a lot of fun. I actually had it write a, um, a goodbye note to my neighbor in the form of a dog. So the dog was like sending a goodbye note to my, my daughter, my kids, uh, my son and my daughter, because they were, um, they loved playing with Wally the dog. So he wrote a note and then we like mailed it to ourselves and, and Wally the, the, you know, my parent, my kids were like really confused and impressed that the dog knew how to write. But you can also do it with slang. Uh, so I wanted to welcome you guys uh, to the masterclass. You know, I speak like, uh, you know, overeducated, you know, pointy headed dude. Uh, but, you know, ChatGPT kind of gave me a little bit better slang. Uh, and then different writing styles. You can write a Shakespeare, Dr. Seuss, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I just put in the prompt, write the 23rd Psalm in the style of Donald Trump. And uh, <laughs> it did a beautiful job. Uh, it's tremendous, really tremendous. The Lord is my shepherd. And let me tell you, nobody knows more about shepherds than me. So... I want to hand it over now uh, in a sec to Nicole. I just want to set the stage for prompt engineering. So as we discussed, prompt engineering is the art and science of designing prompts to get the best output. And there are three primary types of prompts that Nicole is going to walk you through. The simple prompt, the complex prompt, and the mega prompt. And one of the things that you need to keep in mind is the prompt is actually not a single prompt, but it's a series of prompts or what they call a thread. And what that means is when you start a new chat in ChatGPT, that thread remembers the previous prompts. And that becomes really important because you can say, you know, take what you just wrote and put it in a haiku format or in Shakespearean English. And so that's what a thread is. And so a prompt is not a single thing, but it can be a series of things as you refine and get closer to exactly what you want. And one of the ways to think about what is a prompt is it's a little bit like a Google search term. And with practice, we've all gotten better at using Google to find what we need. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nicole to talk about the simple prompt. Okay, simple prompt. Well, simple prompt is exactly as it sounds. It's doing a simple, command or asking a question of chat GPT that doesn't have multiple components. So a simple prompt is just like, hey, chat GPT, what are 10 things that were recently prompted? <laughs> you, can, you can ask it like what's going on. Um, and you can ask chat GPT what the weather is somewhere. You can ask it, you know, what time some office closes. It might actually give you that. You can ask it just in one sentence to write an email to your kid's teacher, a thank you note to your kid's teacher for something. Um, it can be really, really simple. Do you want me to share screen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to do this in chat GPT. I have a lot of things open here. Um, okay, let's fingers crossed it's working today. Um, and my chat GPT might look different than yours if you don't have the AR, AI PRM plugin. It's a Google Chrome extension, and it gives me access to currently it's 2,786 prompts, and I can search for the kind of prompt that I want in here. It's very useful. I can also choose the model of chat GPT that I want. So I'm going to pick four because it's the best by far. Um, and it also lets me select the language of my output, the tone, and the writing style. So if I'm just in default, a simple prompt, write a thank you note. To Sarah's teacher for being so welcoming this school year. So that's pretty simple. Let's see what it does. This is interesting. <laughs> and you'll notice, well, if you've used ChatGPT before, um, four is slower than 3.5 and it gives better outputs. 
And then I have this lovely little thank you note. And then so I cool. can go up to the top and it'll allow me to copy this so I can paste it in a Google Doc. And I could ask it to revise. I pay, yes. The question, do you pay for, um, for absolutely 20 bucks a month is totally worth it. And if you um, scroll up to the top, um, one of the other things you'll notice is the little, you probably haven't even, there's the copy, but then there's the thumbs up, thumbs down. Can you hit thumbs up real quick? So yep. what you're actually doing is you're teaching GPT. Most of us probably skip over the thumbs up, thumbs down, but they love it when you put thumbs up because that is you teaching the model. That was a good response. And then you can give additional feedback and that's you giving incredible value as a free researcher to chat GPT and open AI. Yeah, and I do give it feedback if I get really bad. Usually if I get really bad prompts, I will. I'll just give it a thumbs up with no feedback if it's good. It depends what it is, but I do like to give feedback because I want it to be better. And somehow, I don't know if it's true or not, if it makes them better in my account, I can tell you in Jasper it does, um, but I do want the outputs to be better. So this is just a regular um, simple prompt. Do we want to go to the next one? Yeah, so now we're going to talk about what we call the complex prompt. Yeah. So complex prompt is giving multiple parameters in a prompt. So in this case, I might be doing, I might want to change the language. So we're going to do, let's make it humorous. And we're going to make it academic. And well, yeah, we'll keep it in English. So I'm going to tell it to please rewrite the prompt above. using a uh, bullet point list of five reasons she's a good teacher. Um, I will say a good teacher given that Sarah is a new student, a new student in Miami, a new student with from Seattle with the cultural differences. Differences there to adjust to include food, attitudes. And, and what you see she's doing and the difference between a simple and a complex prompt is she's adding information that mm -hmm. it's then needing to Weather. interpret uh, in, in, in the prompt. So a simple prompt is generally, uh, it goes out and looks in its storage base and tries to create knowledge uh, and a response. A, a complex prompt is you're feeding it information that it's then adapting and responding to. Oh, and it, this is fantastic. Cross country transition master. As a Miami transplant from Seattle, Sarah faced significant cultural and climate differences. Your knack for guiding her through the transformation from rain soaked Pacific Northwesterner to sun loving Miamian has been truly commendable. You've taught her the essential skills, such as distinguishing a Cuban sandwich from a salmon roll and adapting to the infamous Miami time schedule. Weather Whisper, this is amazing. Now, this isn't exactly how I would speak. I might like go in and edit a few things, um, but this gives you so much more context. And if you were writing, so somebody said they did a grant proposal or you know they had ChatGPT help with them. You can see your grant proposal, if you do a simple prompt, that's just respond to this grant proposal based on, you know, this is what my business is. And if you give it more context, you're going to get a better output. Um, I actually had it write a non-compete agreement. And then I said non-compete, non-disparagement. It gave me a great agreement. And, you know, it's not written by a lawyer and should be looked over, but it did a really good agreement for me yesterday.
Yeah. Uh, another example of a complex prompt that I did is I needed to create a teaching guide for one of my courses. And so I loaded a transcript of that session, asked it to summarize the session, and then write a guide for how to teach it. And it was a little complicated because ChatGPT limits the number of words you're allowed to paste to roughly 2,000 words. Um, it does that to basically preserve computing power. And so I had to take my transcript and cut it up into 2,000 word chunks, have each of those chunks summarized in a concise way. And then I had a concise bullet point that was less than 2,000 bullet point list of less than 2,000 words that I could then load in to create the teaching guide. So that's a complex prompt. And just the, the, the possibilities are amazing. I, I'm a, a former journalist. I've published more than 2 million words. And my dream, which I don't think is that far away, is to load all the words I've ever published into a learning model and then have it be able to write in my voice. And then I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I already have that repository digitally. It's my sent mailbox. So I have probably written about 5,000 words in responses and, and emails over the last, you know, seven years running my business. Imagine if there were a company that had access to my sent mail and were able to scan it and they were really good at generative language creation and could respond to my emails and my voice. Oh, I use Gmail and oh, that company is Google. And oh, you can kind of already do that with a tool called Jasper that you're about to see. So that's what I think is on the horizon. And that's what the next sort of phase of the complex prompt is, is they'll be able to write in your voice. And so that brings us now to the queen uh, to, to the mega prompt and Nicole Donnelly is the queen of mega prompts. So what's a mega prompt and how do they work? Okay, well, a good example of a mega prompt, I just got an output. So the outputs, I don't get them right away sometimes. In Jasper, we will, but we could have a prompt that is complex and multiple pages. So for doing marketing strategies, we do a two hour workshop where we ask our clients all of these different questions. And we input into 18 pages of prompts and there's a specific framework around it and then submit it to the AI. So there, it's a really complex scenario um, and you have to know marketing to know how to answer some of these questions too and advise as you're going through the process. But I'd say the mega prompt is a multi-page prompt with a lot of different questions. I'll show you like a mini version of this in Jasper. So <laughs> we were talking about this yesterday. I go to Jasper when ChatGPT is not working and it happens quite often that ChatGPT is not working because it's so busy. So you log on, you try to ask it some questions and it's like failed error, log in and out, it still doesn't work. So I come over here because Jasper has the chat function and it's um, tied into GPT here. And I think it's 3.5, not four, but you have consistent chat access. And then, but the complex prompts over here, we have really simple ones, which I can show you. Um, are we gonna do the Jasper demo later? Or are we just getting through prompts right now? No, just, um, I think we should just go right into the Jasper demo. So the, okay. basically the mega prompt is a complex prompt with lots and lots and lots of inputs. Um, you know, in the case of Nicole's company, when they bring on a new client, uh, I think you have like an 80 questionnaire, like two or three hour meeting where you go through getting all the prompt information they need. You then load it into Robotic Marketer, another tool that we're gonna learn, and then spits out a hundred page, uh, <laughs> you know, marketing strategy. Uh, that is really tailored to the specifics of that company. Yeah, and we have to go through in detail every single bit of information that we're putting in, and we have to make it work so that it's a good prompt for the tool to give us a good output. Yeah, and so, so what, I'd like to, what I'd like you to do now is I'd like to actually do a demo of Jasper AI starting with simple prompts and some okay. of the built-in prompts, and then you can show us the mega prompt templates that they offer. Okay, so let's go back over to ChatGPT real quick. Um, and we are going to 
take this thank you note, this checklist, and I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to go over to Jasper and I'm going to do the content summarizer. So I'm going to paste it in here. We have these tone of voice, friendly, we'll do sassy. <laughs> and then it's going to give me three outputs. So it's just going to do bullet points of the content here. And Jasper takes a little bit to think about things. There was a question about your voice. And if you could get closer to, um, to what your voice is. And with Jasper, if you have a business account, they will help you tone, like tune your voice. And so that everything you're pushing out from Jasper, creating in Jasper has your voice in it. Um, so it took this longer piece, it's 1700 characters and it turned it into these little um, bullet points, like shorter bullet points. And something this is good, like if you have a big blog post or a big document, you put it in here and then it pulls out the, the pieces. So you can go from small to large amounts of content or large amounts of content down to small amounts of content. Um, some other tools that I'm- and the, and the reason she picked three is she has three different versions to now choose from. And you can kind of like piece them together. You might like one of the- yeah summaries from one versus another. So one of the nice things about Jasper is it gives you multiple versions of the response, whereas ChatGPT, it just gives you one and then you have to prompt it for another. Yeah, and with this one, so I can set it down here from three, I think I can go up to 10 or so different um, results. And then I also have a history, which is fantastic. So I can look back in my history. And so if you think about this as working in a team, this is a really good tool so people can see the history of the things that have come out and they might just slightly revise. So it helps to keep that institutional knowledge for your company um, and people can come in here and see what you've already done. Um, we did a video sales letter yesterday. Um, we did this mini video sales letter to write a script for 60 to 90 seconds. And this gets to be a more complex prompt. So it asks for my name, company name, who's your ideal buyer audience, key benefits and features. This is what we mean by a complex prompt. So current pain points, what's a true or negative scary fact, big idea, number of customers for social proof. Anyways, it asks me a lot of questions. This is another good thing about Jasper is it asks a lot of questions so then the outputs can be more robust. So then I get these different ones. I, I did six. I asked it to produce six different video sales letter scripts. And then we took these, we pasted it into a Google Doc, and then we picked kind of the best pieces from each one but it made making a video sales letter. So then actually we are doing three video sales letters and we got enough content from this to do the scripts for three different video sales letters. And just and for those who don't know, a video sales letter is one of the most cutting edge effective ways to advertise is you create basically a, a video of you kind of reciting this script as the owner or spokesman for a company and then you post it on YouTube and you advertise against it. And it's, uh, especially when you're in a consulting kind of setting, a video sales letter is the single most effective way to acquire new customers. So um, uh, Nicole's gonna show her video newsletter and we'll have to, you can play the, the whole newsletter, but we'll have to wrap up here shortly. Yeah, this is really quick. And this, I didn't, you can take your video sales letter script and put it in here. Um, and this is 35 seconds. This isn't the video sales thing. We were just playing with it yesterday, um, but it gives you images. It'll pull from, you could stick a blog post in here and make a video from it, um, but you can put your content in here. This is great. Which uh, software do you use to build this? It looks a lot like Lumen 5. It's Pictory, and I'm going to share a link with, um, I'm going to share a link in the chat that has a doc that has the link for Jasper and for Pictory in it. Perfect. Um, and if you come back next week, uh, you'll get all of the links plus, plus, plus uh, as a thank you for coming back. 
Yeah. And I'll just show you quickly, like more complex prompts. You can actually create what they call recipes. You could create a recipe for something that you do in your business. That's a more complex process. Um, and I'll show you the hero's journey recipe. So Darby wrote this and you can write your own recipes. So the, here's the, basically the prompt or the example for it. This is the prompt. And this is a hero's journey one. We actually use this for story brand and creating a brand script. And so yeah. let, we'll, me, let me just unpack that real quick. So the hero's journey was a concept pioneered by this guy, Joseph Campbell. I studied him in grad school when I got my MFA. And the hero's journey is this kind of uh, mythical journey that every hero from Star Wars to Homer uh, would walk their heroes through. And um, basically, this prompt uh, walks you through how to build a hero's journey narrative for your company or for your client. And Story Brand is a book by a guy named Donald Miller, who created the process that this is now uh, executing and making simple for you to do. So I, I got to tell you, it, you know, the brand story that Donald Miller created, which is a brilliant kind of innovation this makes it unlocks it. You know, I spent $7,000 last year hiring a copywriter to build a brand story for my new website. So this is, if I had known this existed, I might've saved that money. <laughs> well, and it's not perfect. Like the outputs are not perfect and you would still want to have a guide. So for anybody who's a story brand expert, this can expedite their process, but they're still going to ask you the questions. You just might not know the answers. That's where the expert comes in, is in helping you get the right answers to put into the prompt. Because when a company comes to us for marketing, a lot of times they can't add, answer the questions that we ask and that we need to input. So what's your unique value proposition? Who exactly is your customer? You know, can you describe them? That's what we help as a marketing company. We help people figure out so that we can prompt it better. And that's where there is still need for a driver in these situations who can see the road, who understands, who has their license. And um, it is, we were talking about what's the best use of AI. And it's like, it is in your area of expertise. Jeff might do code with it. My husband does code with it. He does you know, a variety of things that way, but I don't know code. So that's not the best use of AI for me. I know marketing and I know story brand. And so that's the best use of it. Um, anyway, so my context in this is really in messaging and marketing and getting the word out there. And that's that's the stuff that I know. So um, anyways, I that is a complex prompt. The, <laughs> the story brand one goes on for like four pages. Oh, you're on mute. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was phenomenal. Um, guys, uh, show your appreciation for Nicole in the chat. If you found that useful, that's her superpower, man. She is so good at this. So you cannot wait to see what she has uh, coming up in future sessions, especially when it comes to uh, marketing strategy and SEO. So I want to hand it back over to the our resident nerd, um, which is Jeff. Uh, and we're going to talk now about the auto prompt. The auto prompt is actually something that's kind of on the cutting edge. Uh, in the last few weeks, uh, the auto prompt has emerged as kind of a trending topic in nerdy AI circles. Um, so, what is the auto prompt, Jeff, and uh, what does it say about the potential future of prompting and prompt engineering? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so we are talking about the autonomous prompt. Um, I would suggest that if you're just getting into artificial intelligence and using these tools, that you actually don't try this because these tools are actually so advanced and experimental right now that they can accidentally cost you a ton of money, break your computers, do all sorts of crazy stuff. But the autonomous prompt is the idea that we are starting to develop prototype tools where instead of actually prompting an AI like you saw Nicole doing, that you just eventually get to the point where you give an AI an end goal. And these artificial intelligence systems figure out how to prompt themselves along the way. So there are a few experimental tools out there right now, like Auto GPT or Baby AGI, all these fun open source tools where people are using things like ChatGPT and GPT-4, but turning them from just simple language models into these autonomous agents where you as a user give them a goal. And so one example that I saw in the wild that was really interesting is a business owner told the 
um, auto GPT agent that it wanted to do market research on its competitors and create some new marketing and brand strategy material. And what this tool was able to do was using these language models, it took control of his computer, it went and it searched the internet for all of its competitors, it read their websites, it pulled the information back, it then extracted the, the marketing differentiation of his company from those websites, and then it produced a Word document where it outlined all of the things it thought was unique about his company and recommendations for how to market it. Um, so this is where we are going. This is not stable right now. Anyone who's played with these tools can tell you they will blow up your computer. They'll cost you a ton of money. But I think at a certain point of maturity, we get to a point where if you're a good prompt engineer and you can do what Nicole is doing right now, that is where the window of opportunity is between now and seven years from now, where you can be really excellent. Probably 10 years from now, I don't think my kids will actually ever have to worry about prompt engineering because they may just tell the robot, hey, build a website for me. But but we're just starting to see the beginning of that stuff. And if you're curious about it, look up like a YouTube video on auto GPT and don't break your computer, please. Uh, well, I'll actually give you a better one. Um, so this past week, um, Brockman, uh, uh, Greg Brockman, who is the OpenAI co-founder who we saw at the beginning of the, the, uh, the, the lesson actually did a TED talk. Um, and a lot of what he focused on was this autonomous uh, prompting and, and integrating uh, not just generative AI from ChatGPT, but bringing in uh, other tools, other websites, other apps, other software uh, in, in, a, in a dynamic and automated way. Um, I watched this for the first time yesterday. It had 900,000 views. Uh, here we are uh, 10 hours later and it's broken 1.1 million in less than one week. So uh, definitely would recommend y'all uh, watch this TED Talk um, and uh, you'll see what the future uh, that we have in store, uh, as long as we don't uh, take the moratorium that Elon Musk is urging uh, and that's right around the corner. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Dan. That's a great TED Talk if you guys get a chance to see it. All right, so we're going to wrap up here. The last piece I wanted to share with you is the AI whisperer. So what is the AI whisperer? Well, the AI whisperer is the job of the future. There's this Washington Post article that tech's hottest new job is someone who knows how to engineer a prompt for the best output. And it's I, I sort of think of it as the revenge of the English major. Uh, suddenly, uh, we were in the doghouse, those of us who've got MFAs in creative writing like me, and now, suddenly, I don't need to know how to code, I, I don't need to know uh, the, the specifics of how machine language works, I don't need to study C+, I, I, can, I don't need to learn Python, I can just describe what I want in really vivid and clear language, and boom, generative AI makes it for me. And so I, I feel really... Um, happy that I'm finally going to beat Jeff uh, because Jeff has been beating me uh, at everything in all areas of life uh, for the last decade that we've been friends. And I'm, I'm very happy that I'm finally going to get my revenge and be better at something finally uh, than you. But I, I've actually watched this guy prompt engineer and he's pretty dang good at that too. Um, so uh, maybe not, but- it, Well, I'm just excited that I can finally write now, which is amazing. <laughs> exactly. So- um, and I wanted to give you guys also just kind of as we as we close this section on on texting prompt engineering, we are at the infancy of prompt engineering and what a prompt is and what a simple versus complex prompt can do. The very infancy, infancy. Those of you who are a little uh, gray in the hair like me will remember back in the day when you had to use Boolean search terms for Google. Remember where you had to do like. Um, restaurant and near me in quotation marks or with, you know, like that whole Boolean thing, the end, the ors, the nots, and what a frank nightmare that was. And then you started to write in like halting phrases in Google search. It was like restaurant near me, tire repair shop in Miami. And then you started to ask questions. You would type, what is a tire repair shop uh, in Miami? And now, it's mostly by voice, right? We click the little button and we just dictate our question. We hit search. 
Over time, they call this the long tail search. The average length of a search query is now, I believe, seven or eight words, when back in the day it was two or three. So what's happened is Google has gotten better and better at learning how to adapt search. And we have gotten better and better at how to use Google as a tool to get what we want. And what I've noticed is the longer tail my search and the more specific I am in my search query, the better the search results. And I, at this point, almost never don't get my desired response in the first or second uh, search query response. And so that's what's going to happen with prompt engineering. Like we are in the infancy of it. It's clunky. Uh, Nicole has been doing this for a while. She could probably tell you stories of nightmares from her early days of trying to get anything useful out of this. Next session, uh, one week from today, we're going to be talking about um, images and, and creating images. And I got to tell you, uh, I, I find creating imagery out of Dolly and Midjourney and uh, Stable Diffusion a complete nightmare. Um, and so that's what's coming up. Uh, and the evolution of the prompt uh, is a big part of it. So what is your homework? Your homework prompt uh, is to use ChatGPT to write a sales email to a potential client or a business partner. We want you to write a sales email using this. You will be impressed. Or if you want, you can write it to your kid's teacher. Um, we, um, to wrap up, just want to kind of review what we've covered today. So. We talked about AI's dominant metaphor when it comes to text translation and email uh, as the metaphor of translating, translating your input and giving you an output. And that output can be coding language. It can be a natural language like Spanish. It can be in a different style or tone of voice. And it can be emergent. It can be, if the temperature is high, it can be a little not so crazy. Uh, and it can be something that it wasn't specifically trained to do. We talked about the five key definitions uh, of what you need to know and the fear that many have of emergence uh, and emergent qualities taking over the world and shooting our nuclear missiles. We talked about the stochastic parrot, this idea of mirroring and how eerie and spookily human and emotive and soulful some of these responses can be. I, I love the story of the New York Times reporter who, uh, Kevin Roos, where ChatGPT tried to get him to leave his wife. There was another story in the New York Times in the Modern Love column about ChatGPT setting a date at a specific date and time in Boston with someone. And she kind of went to see if ChatGPT would show up. It didn't. And then when she wrote ChatGPT asking him where he was, ChatGPT wrote back, oh, something, uh, a family emergency had come up and can we reschedule? I mean, really creepy, weird, emergent properties. This is definitely not what it was programmed to do. Then we went deep into the weeds to the marketing doer uh, and Nicole Donnelly showed us how to prompt engineer the simple prompt, which is just asking it to go out and from its big warehouse of information, tell you something that you didn't know the complex prompt where you feed it information that it then either summarizes or expands upon or interprets or context that it ha that it needs to give you a better response. Generally speaking, if you're trying to work in a marketing and sales setting, complex prompts are gonna do better for you than simple. And then the mega prompt, which is a, a beast. It's more advanced. Uh, you can get them through jasper.ai and they you put in a lot of different inputs and it pushes out a very, detailed, specific, and very useful uh, document for a landing page or a marketing strategy. We then demoed one of our favorite tools, jasper.ai. It's a good backup if ChatGPT is overloaded, and it has a ton of pre-built templates and prompts that you can use to get better, faster output. And then we talked about the autonomous prompt, the future of prompting, where you tell it an outcome. You want ChatGPT to do something, and it then figures out how, and it interacts with different systems and programs in your computer to actually make that happen. In the TED Talk, what the example he said was, you know, get me a shopping list for a delicious dinner, and then go on to uh, a gr grocery website, Instacart, and then populate my shopping cart with all of those ingredients. The one thing he didn't do is hit, uh, 
purchase. He also said, write me a tweet it, uh, with an image that you create. It populated the tweet, it populated the image, and, and then he live posted it. Um, that's what an automatic, uh, 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 an autonomous prompt will do, is it will interact with your computer and, and set things up for you to the point where it's like, you know, schedule the nuclear missile to fire at Russia, you know, and all you have to do is press the red button. So that finally leads to the job of the future, the hottest job in tech, the AI whisperer, the revenge of the English major, uh, the person who's good at clear, concise, powerful communication. So um, I wanted to just share, uh, I wanted to ask my uh, colleagues, Jeff and Nicole, for their ahas from today before we wrap up with our parting thoughts. So Jeff, uh, today, what was your biggest aha from what you heard, uh, the thing that you're going to take away and share with your team? Yeah, I think for my team, since I've always been so deep down the technical rabbit hole, actually seeing Nicole use some of these mega prompts to create really good baseline sets of content and strategy out of the language model engines was super helpful for me. Love it. Love it. And uh, Nicole, what was your aha from today? Well, Jeff, when you first showed the this the cycle of those the autonomous prompting that's something that we're looking at doing so i want to talk to you more about that because we want something that's going to make our content better and use tools to do that so yeah. we're, we haven't figured out how to do it yet in with you the, tools and the that rest of the world <laughs> <laughs> Um, guys feel free to share your ahas in the chat what was the thing that popped for you you know, I think for me, uh, when it comes to Jeff's, um, you know, definitions, I think it's really starting to find analogies of what ChatGPT is and how it learns and what the technical piece. So I, I found like thinking about when we were in conversations about the Tin Man, you know, all head, no heart, and thinking about how we train a dog or how I'm training my child to, you know, pee in the toilet, you know kind of making this really intimidating and very technical technology and finding analogies um, that make it more understandable and a little less intimidating. I also um, am, am, I really understand um, and I'm kind of Im Im impressed by this idea of emergence. And I was listening to a podcast by Ezra Klein where he said, uh, one of the ways they're talking about regulating AI research and AI systems is they need to be able to explain emergent properties and that that would be the standard that they need to meet in order to be able to release it to the public. So when you're thinking about, you know, in the, in the Bill of Rights, you know, there's a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that the um, Biden administration put out last year. You know, so policymakers, governments, you know, Europe is already starting to regulate this. Emergence is a term that you'll see because if you don't understand what the black box of your generative AI system is building, there is inherently something very dangerous about it. And then you're kind of in defense mode where you're trying to figure out every way in which the system can be abused and trying to block them. And then with Nicole, I think every time I see her present, I have the same reaction, which is, I wanna be like Nicole, basically. Like she has done the hard work and the early exploration, the spelunking in the cave that was AI, to find the simple, actionable tools uh, and, and processes that make incredible workflow uh, advances. And uh, you know, she has a course in, in the, the kind of real nitty gritty of what she's learned, where she's going into deep dives with each of the tools and the people who built them and uh, highly recommend it. She's a phenomenal teacher and frankly, a huge inspiration. So thank you, uh, Nicole, for, um, you know, being a part of this. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, we missed you last week, but your uh, avatar uh, did uh, say you're welcome for you. Right. So I want to share this one parting thought. Um, it is a note of caution uh, from my favorite physicist, Stephen Hawking. He said, success in creating effective AI could be the biggest event in the history of civilization or the worst. We just don't know. So we'll see you guys next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. 
1230 on Wednesday, May 2nd for AI for images. It's Wednesday, May 3rd, excuse me. AI for images, social media, and ads. So next Wednesday, May 3rd, AI for images, social media, and ads. Thank you guys again so much. Um, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, a reminder that tonight we have the bonus session with Raoul Bricker. Uh, and on Friday, I'm doing the info session about BizHack's FCMO services. So thanks again, guys, for sticking around. Uh, if you want to put anything new in the chat, uh, I can address your questions. I see we have a couple in the Q&A that haven't been addressed. We'll try to address those as well before we wrap up. Thank you. Thanks. So my head has gotten really big. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I see Martha Mello, you raised your hand. Um, what was your question? You can just type it into the chat. And then uh, let me look at the chat real quick. I'm having trouble seeing what I'm looking for. Oh, Martha, I don't think it's going to let you speak, but if you want to chat your um, question. And there is a question. My course is at AISmartMarketing.com. Yeah. And we have blog posts about all the things that we're talking about here, too. So you can get a lot of information. We also post blogs straight from AI, and you will see what the difference is. <laughs> Um, an anonymous attendee asked, uh, what about information about these recordings? So every Monday, if you register, you should get an email from us with the recording from the previous week's session. So every Monday, midday, you should get an email from us with last week's recording and the recordings of the previous sessions as well. We do require you to register to get access to the recording. And that's why we're encouraging you to spread the word. If there are other people on your team who you wanna use this, please have them register as well. Those are private links. We're not posting these publicly uh, because as I said, we're eventually gonna create uh, and turn this into a course. Yeah. Uh, um, Ariel I asked a question sorry. about ChatGBT's training data. It is only trained through September, 2021. So if you ask it like, who is the CEO of Twitter, it'll tell you Jack Dorsey. So that's correct. So be careful about any information that it's, it's talking about in the recent years or two. So that's Jeff, cool. one of the questions I had is as we feed it information that's more um, modern, does it start to get smarter about 2023 and 2022? Um, it is, it is not actually. And so it's, so it's recent memory of your conversations are making it smarter in that given session with you, but until the company retrains a new version of the model and redeploys it, it's not going into it's like permanent memory. So basically our chats and the input, the information we're inputting uh, is um, more about training and making the model give you better answers than it is about using that information as the basis for which content is shared. Correct at this time. And what essentially we will probably see is with, with the newer versions of GPT as they roll out, they will train them with more and more recent data. And it's possible they'll use our inputs as that training data, but they also have crawled the internet already. So they don't necessarily need all of our training data. You know, a bunch of people are asking for the link to the first session. Uh, John or, or Mike, can you just throw the YouTube link from session one into the chat? You guys can uh, take that again. It should be in the email that you'll get. If you just registered in the last couple of days, you'll get it on Monday as well. Um, there was also, um, you know, when is it going to update to more modern? I think really what's going to happen, uh, and Google is very well positioned, is it's going to start pairing, searching the current internet with generative AI and the large language model. Jeff, can you explain like how Bing search and mm -hmm. uh, Bard on Google like interact with the LLM that gives the generative AI and the internet yeah. that gives the up-to-date up data? Absolutely. So you're seeing this with Google's BARD, which is their, their language model for searching, not available to everyone yet. And Bing is using GPT-4 and OpenAI is starting to roll out plugins as well. What you can think about is these, these companies are essentially using the language model, almost like a human interface device, almost like your mouse or your keyboard, where you can talk to the, to the language model. And if you ask it a factual question, 
In the background, the language model is then going to a different tool to go search the internet or to get some more information from the data and bring that back into its conversation. So when you actually are engaging with these things and as these tools evolve, you'll start to see the language models look like they can do a lot more things. And what's really happening is the language model is almost acting like an interface between you and all of the other tools and services that these companies have to offer. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Um, we had some kind of more um, operational questions. Do you need to register once or do you need to register every week? Uh, Mike, you need to answer, register once. You're going to be get sent an attendee link that is yours and yours alone, and that'll let you get into every session. Um, we also uh, recognize that some people aren't getting those attendee links. It's just like a little um, mess up on our side, frankly. And so we're also give you in those emails, just a permalink, you'll have to re-register. Sorry for the trouble, uh, but that'll help you access uh, the program. There was a question about the uh, bonus session that we have tonight with Rael Bricker. And if you wanna attend that and you did not answer yes to the poll because you came late, you should not come late. Uh, then go ahead and throw your email into the chat now and we'll add you to the invite manually. But at uh, the beginning of the session, we mentioned that we're doing this bonus session uh, tonight and we invited you guys to just click yes on the poll. If you did that, uh, John on my team is gonna then add you to the calendar invite for this evening. I also um, saw someone made a comment so, about- Just one question, you know, Ken, uh, you know, it takes so much work for my small team to do all the work we need to do to produce the summary, to, to do the, the video. I, I know you're eager for this material, but unfortunately, you know, if you wanna get it sooner, you're just gonna have to attend live. That's what our preference is. But, you know, Monday's the fastest we can do. We were working all weekend to get it to you. Uh, sorry, Jeff, what were you gonna say? Oh, I just saw someone had commented about chat GPT looking like the performance is degrading over time. And I think people just should be aware that as you use these tools, uh, these companies' attempts to make the tools more safe are essentially pulling back some of the functionalities. So if you start adopting these things in your workflow, just be aware that you might see changes to how well these tools work over time as, as the companies are trying to regulate them and, and prevent them from doing dangerous things. Perfect. Um, any other questions, Nicole or Jeff, that you guys see that you want to tackle before we wrap up? I've been asked a few times for the prompts from last week, and I'm trying to find out my history is so long in ChatGPT. I will put it in that doc um, that I, I posted the link a couple times. I'll put it in that Google doc when I can find it. Um, so I am looking for, for those prompts. Great. And uh, John Novar, uh, Kay Nelson, uh, Brenda, um, I see your emails here. You should be getting an invite shortly, uh, Antoinette. Oh, nice to see you, Antoinette. Um, anybody else who wants to come to tonight's session, it's at night, uh, it's gonna be great. Uh, but I also know that you guys probably have better things to do than spend three hours with me today. Uh, so don't feel obligated. Um, if there's anything really amazing, we'll probably excerpt it and throw it into one of the future sessions. But uh, feel free to throw your emails in there. Uh, we're gonna grab those. Um, any anything else, guys, uh, that you wanted to say uh, or any other questions you wanted to address before we wrap up? I don't think so. I think we've got a lot of most of those questions answered, a lot of logistics questions. We'll send out some information. Yep. Um, and then uh, excited about next session. I saw some questions about things like images. and We'll get into that next week. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I will say if you're like me, uh, email uh, images has been brutal, honestly, to get it uh, to get it to work right. Uh, I and, and, and video and audio is even harder. Um, so, gosh, I am excited to learn from the best of the best who's uh, who I brought you to uh, brought with you here. Uh, we're also going to hear from Olivier. Do you want to say a quick thing about Olivier? Oh, Olivier Kennedy has a creative agency in Switzerland. He's a uh, French Swiss, and he has a process where his artists internally have created a way to prompt mid journey so that they can test images and create things that they can show to their clients. These are very high end clients, high end like Rolex level, at least, and maybe above that. Um, and they're producing images that are good enough to test in ads. 
Wow. And they've saved so much money on photo shoots. Like when, when I talked to him, he saved $20,000. He canceled a photo shoot because they were able to prompt mid journey at, in such a way that they ended up not needing the photo shoot. Wow. Well, that's who you get to look forward to for next week. I'll see some of you guys tonight. Um, uh, there has been some questions about what time, uh, and the time is 6.30 uh, to 8 this evening. So with that, thank you guys. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for sticking with us for the full two hours. Gosh, uh, uh, and we'll see you guys in, in a week from today or this evening or at the info session. A lot going on. Thanks. Thank you.